hitter, one of the best hitters of all time, Stan, the man, Musio. 22 years, 18 times he hit 300, won seven National League batting titles. And ladies and gentlemen, a couple of years ago, we asked Stan, the best harmonica playing Hall of Famer ever to play. You want to bring him back this year? Can you do it? Did you bring it? What do you want to play, Stan? We're going to play uh, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. We're all going to sing it, too. Hey, everyone. It's Don with Don's Field of Dreams Cards. As you can see here, I got two of my buddies on. The Drew of Vintage Legacy and Joe for Soft Corners. How are you guys doing this morning? I'm doing good. Doing well. Good. How are you doing, Don? Good. It's 8 o'clock in the East Coast. It's funny. I made a video with John, our two guys, one hobby last night. So I got off of that about 1030, went to bed, and here I am again. So, But I wanted to have these two guys on because I think we all have something in common. And uh, that's a certain player that we like. It, and it got me thinking, Drew, I was talking to you a couple of weeks ago, and you said guys kind of get pegged as, you know, he's the Bowman guy or he's the – uh stan musial guy or he's the yankees guy but and i do get pegged as a musical guy but i'm not the only one and uh, that's why i want to have you guys on um to be honest you're the only two i can think of in the card community that are, are musical fans um and we're going to talk about stan today sounds good so none of us i believe have ever lived in st louis correct i know i haven't no nope. why don't you guys start and tell me you know why is Stan Musial one of your favorite players to collect or watch? Go ahead, Jeff. While I drink some Stan Musial coffee. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not really – I don't have a great answer. It was just as I appreciated uh, or grew, grew an appreciation for, you know, the roots of the game and the older guys and Hall of Famers and everything like that, it just – he always just struck me as the guy that was underappreciated and under – and then you look at his stats and like, I just think he's never, I mean, I'm sure we do, but general, like, um, you know, large portion of the population, he's never brought up as an inner circle hall of famer, like with the top. And I think he's right there. I like, you know, top five, six all time. And it's just, he never gets, you, you never hear a bad thing about him. It's just, you never hear enough about him. I don't think so. It was just always that for me, just kind of like always the underdog kind of mentality. And just like I said, you never hear a bad story. And I just always I always like the, you know, nice guys finish first mentality. So um, right. to me, that's just always what it was, basically. Is that a real shirt you're sporting right there? Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> All right. There it is. It's funny, I wore this at, well, I've only been to one national so far, Atlantic City, and I wore it, and everybody just assumed I was a huge Cardinals fan. <laughs> well, that's funny. When I when I was buying musical stuff, every once in a while, someone would just throw in random Cardinal cards. I'm like, yeah. not a Cardinal. I get that, too. Yeah. <laughs> but I still appreciated it, but I'm like, uh, okay, what do I do with these? Yeah. Go ahead, Drew. So, you know, for me um... – as a young kid, I always – I loved uh, certain types of players. I loved the players that would go out there, hustle, dirt on the uniform, play hard, consistent. But but um, I also the, – the guys who just seem to love doing it. You know, they just – it's like no matter how good they are, how long their career was, whether it was short or long, they always just seem to be in awe of the fact that they got to play Major League Baseball. And, um, and that started as a kid for the team that I rooted for. And as I started researching into, you know, learning more about baseball history, I was looking for those kind of guys. And, you know, Musil is one of those guys. I mean, like Joe mentioned, he's, you know, he, he seems to be um, underappreciated as far as his place, not, not necessarily in the hobby, although, yes, but within baseball history, you know, when you look at his numbers and the consistency of what he played for the length of time that he played, uh, it's, it's kind of a shame that he's kind of overlooked um, historically 
Um, but, you know, he had a lot of things going against him. He wasn't controversial. He wasn't always in the media. You know, he he didn't run around on his wife. You know, he wasn't, um, you know, uh, you know, in barroom brawls all the time. I mean, he played a harmonica for fun, for goodness sake. I mean, he was about as down to earth guy next door as you could get. And and there's just something about that that was appealing to me and still is uh, about him and so many other players, too. You, know, you were talking about him not running around and getting drunk and everything. There's a great interview with Bob Costas talking about the time that Muzo and Mantle were well retired by this time. Muzo invited Mantle over to his house for dinner. And Mantle said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to stay sober tonight because I have too much respect for Stan. And he said, I had more talent than Stan. But Stan got every inch of talent he had out of himself where I wasted mine. And, you know, it was a struggle for him to stay sober one day, but he's like, I'm, I'm going to do it for Stan. And that just says a lot about Stan right there. Yeah, I agree. So on my end, why I like Stan is, you know, he's from Pittsburgh. So that's the initial reason I like him. But it's kind of sad is most – he's not, like, revered here in Pittsburgh. No one – most – like, even my brother the other day didn't even know Musi was from the area. But yet, when you look at football, we've got Johnny Unitas, Joe Namath, Dan Marino, Joe Montana, Jim Kelly, all from Western Pennsylvania. And people talk about that all the time. But none of those guys played for the Steelers. But yet, they don't talk about music. And maybe it's because of how long ago he played. I don't know. But that was my initial attraction to it. And I've gone down to the town. I've seen the house he grew up in. It's Denora, Pennsylvania. And it's a, it's a very depressed area. It's a former steel mill town on the river. There's... You know, all the shops are boarded up. It, it's pretty sad, actually. But this is there's no industry there to attract people to to move there. And um, you know, there's a field named after him. His high school's there. So I've driven around. There's a little museum that I haven't been able to get into yet because you almost got to make an appointment because it's so small. Like they get volunteers. And it's not even the museum museum. It's called the Smog Museum. So it was a big smog from the mills in the early '40s that killed a lot of people in the town. And I guess they got one little room for Stan in there. Um, and then there's also a big placard for the Griffies because they're from the same town. Mm -hmm. And uh, Junior was born on the same day as Stan in the same yep. town, which is amazing. Yep. And actually, if if Montana and Musial were close in age, they would have actually gone to the same high school because Musial's high school no longer exists, and they go to the high school that Montana went to. And he's Polish. I'm Polish. And I even reminds me of my dad a little bit, not not baseball wise, but my dad was a traveling salesman for Colgate, sold toothpaste and laundry detergent and stuff. And he used to call on Stan's father in law's store. So he got to meet his father in law. He never met Stan, though, which would have been cool. But just, you know, that kind of generation, you know, Stan would be, I think, seven years older than my dad. So it just reminded me a lot of him, like you said earlier, Drew, you know. And, and Joe, you know, no, no controversy, just a good guy. Yeah. <clears throat> that was one thing I forgot to bring up too. He's I'm growing up in the nineties. I was obviously a huge Ken Griffey Jr. Fan and with both of them, I'm one day away. My birthday is November 22nd. So I'm one day away from sharing a birthday with both of them. So it's just kind of natural being a Griffey fan. It kind of naturally, it wasn't because of that, but it was just a cool thing. Put to bring. your mom away today, man. <laughs> wow. I wish you would have. <laughs> but um, you guys got anything to show? Yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff, and I don't, I don't know. I he's one of those guys that, uh, one, as far as collectability goes, there was a ton of stuff produced um, of him because he was so popular, especially in the St. Louis and and uh, you know the Midwest area. Um, so besides just cards, there's tons of stuff, but they don't fetch the price tags of guys like Mays or Mantle or, or whoever, Clemente even. So you can get some really interesting and really cool stay usual things and not spend a ton of money. So um, I've, I've got a bunch of stuff. I don't want to, you know, um, oh, yeah, you know right. monopolize. Right. We'll take uh, you don't have to but, show them all at once. Well, no, that's true. So, um, so we'll Yo, I thought you had a Guinness there at first. That's your coffee mug. I'm like, <laughs> coffee mug. Yeah, it does look like that. <laughs> Um, so we'll start, let's see, uh, we'll start with his rookie, which is his 48 Bowman. And um, so there's my copy of it. And it's a pretty good copy. There's a little bit of a, 
I don't know what it looks like, a little staining on the bottom. But, uh, but like I said, you know, if, um, you know, if a guy like uh, Mazer Mantle rookie was in here, never could you touch it. You know, I mean, they're a few years later in the 51 Bowman, but, and I can't touch those. I never could, even back when cards were, quote, cheaper. Uh, but I was able to pick this up, and, and you know, if anybody that knows me knows my collection, you know, I don't have high-grade cards. I, I have some nice cards, but I've, I've done it intentionally over the years. But to be able to pick up a, a musical rookie, um, I think at the time, now it's been, you know, probably more than 15 years since I've got it, but I, I don't even think I spent $100 on it. Wow. And um, and even now today, it's, it's still comparative to – to other things with prices gone up, it's still relatively affordable for who he is within baseball history right. and that era of card collecting. So, yeah, he's not cheap, but he's not like you said. It's not you're not killing yourself. It's an attainable card if you need to save up or whatever for it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So there's there's my first uh, break the ice card to show. So. There you go. Come on, Joe. All right. Well, I wanted to show this one because I think I started the story when we did the uh two guys one hobby when i did it with you and john mm -hmm. uh, i showed the first um what first got me into really vintage cards at all and then stan musual um i picked up well i have them aside there but it was the 58 the 59 and i think the 61 cards but they're all like probably i mean they're all raw yet they probably would have graded like fours but this is really the card. It's my favorite card of his, definitely that I own. I mean, I think the Red Heart is a beautiful, probably his best looking card, but I don't own that yet. But um, this is my favorite card of his, and it's in terrible shape. And I just got it graded just because I wanted, I wanted it to just kind of preserve what the terrible shape it's in. But um, so this is the '52 Bowman. Oh yeah, oh, um, great card. So this this means more than i mean it's my favorite musical card um and it means more for me collecting wise because this was like um you can't really see it's a one now but i mean it's all creased up it's all there's stains all over the back and but this was like i said i bought those first three cards and this was the next one i bought and i think it was like 60 dollars or something like that raw and, um but it really is what kind of <clears throat> Uh, transitioned me into the way I collect now. It's kind of what was the impetus for how I named my channel Four Soft Corners because that's really how I started collecting was just um, I, I realized if I buy cards in you know worse condition, I can ultimately end up buying more cards because I can save some money on each one. So um, that's why I just decided to, I mean, I'd like to have a nicer copy of that someday, but that's why I finally decided just to grade it and keep it. Cause it, I like that it's in that condition. I like the story that's behind it and everything. And I like that it kind of drove, that's the way I, the road I started going down with the way I collected and ended up, you know, leading to me being able to pick up more stuff because I was willing to pick up cards in that condition. But that's just one of the most meaningful cards in my collection because of that and it's my favorite stem usual card so yeah well if we're showing beaters i'm going to show one and uh this is actually not my card this is chris from missouri's who when we were at um strongville last year he's like here i want you to hold on to this until you get your own and uh someone was joking because i'm selling off a few cards and they're like how much do you want for this card I'm like, <laughs> oh, they're cheap in a way but uh that's just such an amazing card of his and uh, I hope to, to have a copy of it for myself someday and I can give this back to Chris. But one thing about Musial, he didn't have a ton of cards. And it's a shame that he didn't have some of the classics, the 53 tops and the 56, and I can go on. But he's got a lot of unique items. Like Drew said, you can find things, um, you know, like the 1950 pinup Musial. So there's a lot of oddball things out there. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the national like about this tin. Yeah, I love that. I yeah, love that. it's like finding things like that are a lot of fun, you know, because the few cards I don't have are basically unattainable. You know, they're so rare and mm -hmm. yeah, just, I'm not going to get those. So it's looking for other items out there. Um, and Strongsville last year, uh, Scott Reindeer Studios had. They call them something packs, picture packs or something. Mm -hmm. 
the Indians and Satchel Page, and I said, "Who's the dealer that you got that from?" And he took me over, and I don't normally collect photographs, but the guy had this photograph of Musial on spring training. I was like, "That's a cool piece." That's interesting. I don't know if I can somehow you can. I mean, be the presenter. Oh, I'm gonna try. I don't want to mess this up, but yeah. And on the back, it just says. Original 1948 spring training tape one photo. So, yeah. So speaking of that, I, I have one too. It's uh, another spring training of, of usual and uh, batting in a batting cage. And um, Famous again, things. it's, it's a great picture. It shows that, that kind of quirky stance he had uh, where he would just coil up uh, feet together. The, what do they call it? The foot in the bucket. And, um, but it's just one of those cool little items. And I found this actually at an antique store and, you know, we, my wife and I like to go to antique stores. I always look for baseball stuff and almost never find baseball. Right. Stuff. I'm down in Georgia and it's just, it just doesn't happen often, but, but I came across this and, and she's like, you totally need to get that. So it's stuff like this that you can find um, going back to some of those ad pieces you had. Uh, I got, I picked this up this year. It was actually a gift from, from somebody else. And, you know, Musial was one of the guys that um, is on those Wheaties cards from the early fifties. And uh, as an ad campaign in comic books, um, <clears throat> advertising Wheaties, uh, this was in here. So this is a page from a comic book, and it's actually a Stan Musial comic. And uh, it talks about, you can see, you know, it's got the Wheaties thing on it. And it's, I mean, it talks about Musial coming up, and that, you know, it's a very typical thing. that The game's down, and he goes in, and he hustles around, and, and he ends up scoring, and he gives all the credit because he ate his Wheaties that morning. And it's very corny and cheesy and, and right. very, you know very mid 50s or early mid-century 50s kind of thing but it's awesome the colors on it are great the pictures are great you know and it's just it's a snippet of of advertising using a ball player to get kids to want to get their products and uh and they're just really neat items out there and again not very expensive so yeah this is actually his son so they got his son on an ad for shoes it says Dick oh, that's funny. That's great. I've got, got this piece too. Oh, that's great. So I actually see this, Alex Bowman 53 texted me. I think it was like $10. He's mm -hmm. like, you see this on eBay? And uh there we go. So for ten dollars, I figured I can't go wrong. I'd yeah. like to get these matted or framed or do something with them at some point, but I just haven't. It's still a card, but this is just to go with Drew's ad piece there. This is oh, yeah. about the most oddball type thing or non-traditional thing i have is his wheaties and i just got that graded as well you have his portrait no i don't have the portrait i just have the i like the action one better yeah i do too but um yeah there's the portrait oh those are great i don't have those um out of all the playing days usual cards that are within reason that's probably some of the only i don't have uh, like you said, there's some really, really crazy expensive ones. But uh, and uh, alluding back to what Joe said, because I'm not going to let this go by without bringing it up. But being in that 54 Red Heart set, absolutely a beautiful card of Musial. It's a great set. And uh, I didn't grab it. It's on the other side of the room. I'm not going to go get it right now. But yeah, there you go. But, uh, you know, I recently got the ad piece for it and, and made a, a little frame for it. And, and it's up with my set and collection. And I absolutely love it. I mean. Again, he was uh, he was he was uh, relatable somehow to kids, to adults. Uh, he was very well used for advertising for different products, and just because he was that guy, you know, that uh, that you kind of knew or you felt like you could know, I think that's what was his appeal to fans. Um, but because of that, it kind of went against him as far as historically because he wasn't worshipped as a as a hero that was, you know, like not even human. Uh, like some of the other guys were, like Babe Ruth was, or or like Mickey Mantle was. So because he was just a, a regular guy in, in a regular world, um, his prices and stuff kind of stayed regular. And um, so that's good and it's bad, depending on how you look at it. But we're not doing this for value, and and, and getting things are, are neat. Um, one thing I have, I'll show off real quick, uh, is this. And this is, this is an actual vinyl record, Stay in the Man's hit record, and it talks about Stan teaching kids how to hit and i've actually heard the i'll try to pull it out you know it's an actual record and um 
and inside there's a booklet and it go page by page. They'll say, now turn to page one and this is how I grip the bat and this is how I do this. And again, not you can find them on eBay. Shoot, you can find them autographed on eBay if you want it. And uh, it's a great picture of them. It's a different type of, of uh, I'll try to lean back, a different type of um, item. And uh, and it's so very stand usual. I mean, he's he's standing there with a kid and, and showing this. And and again, he was he was relatable. Uh, kids could approach him. Uh, that reminds me, I have this other thing. Uh, this is the official baseball guide from 1964. So it was right after he retired. But it's it's got a drawing of Musial on the front, and he's just signing an autograph for a kid. Uh, I've never seen that before. Yeah, I, uh, my brother gave me this for Christmas a few years ago. I thought it was kind of neat. And it's nothing more than a, st a statistics book. I mean, there's a few black and whites. It really has nothing to do with Musial outside of the fact that he's on the cover. But the fact is, is he had just retired, and they chose to put him on the cover. And it's not a picture of him swinging big or, or some, with that smile or anything. He's just signing an autograph for a kid. And to me, that's just a, a neat piece. And, and you can find stuff like this all over the place if you just start being intentional about looking for it. Right. Yeah, that's why I'm looking through here. That reminded me, I bought this at a garage sale. And again, I rarely find uh, baseball stuff at garage sales. And I should have looked at this before because there he is. So there's Musio in here. There you go. And it gives you all kinds of tips. I mean, you can, you know, there's all kinds of players in here, not just Hall of Famers. But, you know, I think I paid 50 cents for it. You know, there, there's Larry Yogi Berra. So just cool, unique stuff, like you said, that you can find mm -hmm. without breaking the bank. And, or you can have friends on YouTube that when you visit them, they give you a little musical gift. So what is that? Tell me more about that. Um, this, this dude in Georgia gave it to me. Oh, that's, oh. that's good. <laughs> so Biggie's, Museum of Biggie's was a restaurant in St. Louis at the end. I, I think it was like a steakhouse. And yep. if you go on eBay, there's there's plates and glasses. Although those are a little more expensive than you would think. That's why I've never picked one up. Mm -hmm. But um, it's other cool stuff. And I yep. actually might do a video. There you go. I was looking around my room at how many musical things have been gifted to me. I think mm -hmm. I a whole video just on musical stuff. Like here's another item that was gifted to me. Oh, that's great. And it says on the back, um, you can see here's writing on it. It says presented with compliments of the St. Louis Cardinals. You know, this whole guy needs his glasses. To the fans who attended Stan's last game as an active player, September 29th, 1963, Bush Stadium. So I actually have two of these because I somehow wanted to incorporate this with this, but it's kind of boring. So I haven't figured out what I would do with that. But um We'll see. Yeah. Another thing uh, about uh, that people is, is if you're a collector, you know, I I think he kind of has this assumption. Well, there's not so many cards of him. And I don't really think that's true. It's just that he wasn't in the initial tops cards for the first few years. So, it, you know, we, we kind of all grew up with tops being the company, no matter how old you are. And, um, so there's this sort of uh, stigma that, well, he just was, a, you know, he's a later, but he had, a, he had a number of cards. They just weren't tops. And, uh, you know, his first uh, uh, appearance in a tops card, uh, as I, I like to tell people, is actually in 1956, mm -hmm. not 1958. And, uh, and I'll show it real quick. But in 1956, he's actually on the, the St. Louis Cardinals team card. So that's his actual first now. Yeah, he's tiny in there and there's a little picture, but he's on there. And it's his, you know, it's his, uh, his Perfect. likeness is his name. But in 58, you know, that all-star car, but you can tell how popular he was as a player at that point because Topps triple printed that car. So on a, a printing sheet, they put it three times, knowing full well that kids were going to want to stay unusual. And this was towards the end of his career. And um, it's a beautiful card. And uh, Don, I'm sure you have it. And I don't, Joe, do you have a copy of it? Yeah. Yeah, great card. Love it. And uh, it's actually a card I have three times um, because you can pick them up super cheap. You right. know, I, I showed one off a couple weeks ago. I made a display with, with that card and, and a Ted Williams. I have a regular card. And I actually found this at a shop uh, not too long ago. And uh, it's a copy of it. And it's actually autographed. 
And uh, it's not a great autograph. The the pen started skipping out, so he, he wrote over the S three times. Um, <laughs> but it, to me, that's kind of cool. That that again, it shows his. He was just a guy. He's trying to sign his name, and the pen didn't work. We've all done that, so you kind of scribble on it. And um, you know, the value of the card's not very high, but the the coolness of the card because of that to me is kind of neat. So, um, so if you're into autographs, you can pick up Stan Musial autographs for practically nothing compared to other guys of the same era of the same caliber. Yeah, he was a prolific signer. Yeah. I got this off Tom C. It was like $48. Yeah, I have that one too. That's a so, great one. I mean, already slabbed <laughs> autograph, like really nice bold autograph of him. Yeah. I mean, it, for <laughs> less than $50. I mean, it's yeah. just. This one cost me a little more. <clears throat> it's my only autograph ball. Mm -hmm. And I liked it because. I don't know if you can see here. It's got his Hall of Fame year. Yeah. He wrote the man. He did the number of hits. And I bought this at the National, and I actually had our buddy Jake Brewer, who's sort of an expert on this stuff, come and look at it for me. Or at least like, he is. You should. He'll tell you a lot of stuff. But nah, just... That's true. <laughs> uh, at 3630, you know, he, he had the same amount of hits on the road and the same amount of home, which is – yeah. Consistency. He almost had. This, I think he had nineteen hundred and fifty-one RBIs and nineteen hundred and forty-nine runs too. So he was yeah. two away from, from having the exact same amount of runs scored as he did driven in too. It's just crazy. I think part of the reason he's not as well known too, you know, during the war he was in the Navy for a year, but he wasn't a war hero like Ted Williams or you know, yeah. Paul Peller was in there and all those guys. He was only there for a year, and I don't know how he got away with only being in a year, but, um, you know, that's just not part of the allure of Stan. And, you know, when they voted the top 50 players, remember they all went to the field and all the living players. Yeah. 99. Mm -hmm. And he actually didn't get voted in and they put him in. Like, how could you leave Stan out? Like how yeah. can Stan's not vote for Stan Musial? Yeah, I looked at that more. I just read an art because I was thinking about that, and it was a special. They would specially put him in then because I think it was a fan vote, and I think he finished eleventh as the outfielder, or something like that. So he wasn't, and then they put him in. But it kind of speaks to, I mean, like as far as we, and when I said about him being underrated earlier, I meant more so as in terms of history. People don't mm -hmm. look at his stats like that in terms more than in terms of the hobby, but like. I wanted to bring up when Drew said about like him being triple printed, like the other famous card being triple printed in that 58 all-star set is Mickey Mantle. So like just as far as, I mean, that's like the peak of his, I mean, his popularity and well, maybe not the peak, but I mean, there's no probably better thing, but I mean, Stan Musial had already, that was at the tail end of his career, but I mean, he was pretty much like Mr. National league at that point. Like he, owned every record and um but like so at the time and well I, this was the only other piece i had this is from 1948 a baseball digest with him on the cover and that's so good though that's uh i don't remember if that's his last mvp season or if it was 47 but either way it's at the tail end of that season but like the word like from their contemporaries like i mean that's probably why he was triple printed in that set but just for whatever reason it didn't last. And then you see that at the end of the century, like it, from the fan wise, like it just to not even crack the top 10 as best outfielders of all time is kind of, yeah. I mean, Mark McGuire also got voted in as the first baseman for that team. So, I mean, that was the year after the home run record yeah. and everything like that. He, he was the star. Yeah. But no, but that, I just wanted to bring that up. Like, it seems like, I mean, the words of his contemporaries, there's no, I mean, it's everybody knew how good he was, but it just, for whatever reason, it just didn't last over the years, I don't think, to. Yeah, there's some YouTube videos with Ted Williams and Stan and Ted talking about how great Stan was. He was, you know, according to Ted, the National League version of himself. Um, and it's funny seeing them stand next to each other. Like, Musio looks tiny next to Ted Williams. Yeah. Man, oh, I, yeah, I watched that video and it's just funny too because it's it's basically just Ted Williams talking the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much what you'd expect because he's that huge personality and and it's just Stan with that huge smile just laughing at everything. But that's kind of the way you remember him. 
Yeah. That's a great piece. That Rawlings piece is really good. Yeah. You guys have seen the Rawlings box with the gloves? Yeah, I've seen on them. I've seen them online. I've never. Yeah, seen them. That, that's a amazing piece. Yeah. But he has so many different stuff. You know, he had the Burke Ross. Hold on, I got that one somewhere. You get from Allen's cards. Yeah. One of the few cards where he's actually fielding. Wait a minute, yeah. flag. Oh, okay. <laughs> you think there? I was like. Wrong with you. Do you guys have the Bond bread at all? I do not. There you go. That's I. Like, I didn't know. Is that the same image or is it just similar image? It's a. Uh, I think it's. Let me look. Here, hold the Bond bread up. I'll hold this one up. Let's... I think it's the same image. If you look at his uh, the sleeve on his uh, his throwing arm, it sort of rolled up at the elbow. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, I believe it's the same image. So. Um, I'm trying to think what else I have that's kind of different. I like the red men. I just, yeah, you were I speaking about Jake before. I just picked that, this one up from Drake, Jake, actually. <laughs> that's so, so funny story, Joe. I was actually with Jake when he got that card about a month ago. I went up and, and met with him and he walked around at a show and he was looking for some cards to pick up for inventory. That whole day we walked around, he picked up two cards, and that was one of them. I didn't know you were the one of the people that got it. So he's probably like, some poor sucker is gonna buy this soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, I know a guy up north that'll take this thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of funny that he picked that up when we oh, Luca cards. Yeah, see, I don't have that either. That's a good one. Um and then this one's awesome. Even though it's not a plain day card, but no, but it's still great. And again, the history within collecting and that they included him in that set. You know what I mean? Yeah. One of the things about Musil is if, if you look at his career, if he started literally two years earlier, I think he would be looked at completely different. So his rookie, the first time he appeared was 1941. Um, but, uh, you know, he was he was just an upcoming star. Well, of course, 41 was the year of Ted Williams' 400, uh, 400 season and the 56-game hitting streak of, of DiMaggio. Both of those guys started back earlier the, in the late 30s. I really believe if Musial had started in 38 or 39 like the other two and then had those early years, um, you know, in the, just those couple of years, he would have been revered much differently. But then the war happened, the shift on focus happened, and, uh, and, and you know, card production basically stopped uh, for all, nearly a decade. And by the time they started producing cards again, like with the 48 Bowman, uh, one of the interesting things is Ted or not, um, Musil won three MVPs. All three of them were before his rookie card was even printed. And I think that has something to do with it was the fact that he was already an established superstar, but he wasn't, he, you know, kids were the ones buying these and looking for them and they wanted the, the new kid that was exciting and young and he was already established. So the Warriors, as much as it hurt the statistics of a lot of players, I think it hurt the popularity of Musil. Um, because the focus obviously was on the war and not on, you know, the the chase for 400 or the 56 game hitting streak like the other two. But if you look at those three players, Musial, Williams, and Dimaggio, they're really considered three of the greatest hitters of all time. Just absolutely hitters that had power. So not like a high average high hits guy like Ty, like um, like Ty Cobb or a high home run guy like Babe Ruth. But if you look at just a combination of both those three guys they played at the same time they're all contemporaries and um you know they have a lot in common they're all three were sons of immigrants um all three of them were franchise players they only played for one team uh all three of them were just absolutely um worshipped within the city that they played at but personality they were all completely different people you know yeah. ted williams was was ornery and grouchy and he was like the old grandpa get off my lawn sort of person you know, DiMaggio was aloof and, and distant, and Musil was the guy. You know, one of the, my favorite stories about Musil was, you know, he, he retired and lived the rest of his life out in St. Louis. <clears throat> and he still loved baseball. And there are stories about how he would go out to a Cardinals game, and there's a huge statue of him outside the stadium, outside of Bush Stadium. And he would just go and lean on his own statue. statue. This is an older man, a senior citizen, and play the harmonica until people would recognize him. And they'd come up and get pictures with him, and he'd just meet the fans and sign autographs, and he was just stand musual. Be Ted Williams didn't do that, you know what I mean? Right. And, uh, and, uh, and it just made him that down-to-earth, kind of cool person that anybody could just 
walk by and see and be like, hey, there's old Stan, you know. And so I'm, I'm bringing all that up because one of the pieces I have is from 1949. It's a baseball magazine, but it's got all three of them on there. Uh, uh, the, 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 the best hitters. And they're all included, you know, and and, and it's, it's a, I love, uh, you guys are probably learning this, but I'm loving magazines. You can see them all behind me. Yeah, it's the only one I have. Uh, yeah, that's the one I don't have. Um, Jeff D, Big Blue 77 sent me this. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful one. Yeah. Uh, I've got this one from 48. So again, and, uh, and this one's actually mm -hmm. autographed, the only autographed copy of magazine I have. And then I, I brought this one because I think it's funny because, um, you know, and we, we think about this with baseball cards of why did they pick that photo to put on a card because it's terrible. This has to be the absolute worst photo ever put on the magazine cover of a superstar. But this is a Stan Musial. It's a sport life from, let me find the year here, 1950. And that's the picture that they picked. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I know he's in full swing. So, you, you know, your face distorts and all this other stuff. But you would think they probably got more than one or two. And, or if they did, that that's the best one they got. I mean, I would be like, well, maybe we'll put him up at the top and put uh, Jerry Coleman, who's the guy up here. Maybe he should have been on the big cover. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's a, it's kind of a funny thing because it's. Like it's, it's two in the morning and he's leaving a bar. <laughs> exactly. It's like you could put this up against the 58. Um, uh, Brooks Robinson and be like, okay, which is the uglier photo, you know? Um, but anyway, again, it's just fun and, and there's so much stuff out there. So, yeah, going back to what you said about being a regular guy playing the harmonica on the statue. And again, I'm going to reference Bob Costas because he does a, some great pieces on stand. But Bob Costas lived, I think he still lives in St. Louis, but his mm -hmm. daughter and Stan's granddaughter were friends. And he said, you can come over on Saturdays, but I or I can't leave on Sundays because Papa Stan is bringing McDonald's over on Sunday. And I can't come over because I got to have McDonald's with Papa Stan. That's just fun. <laughs> you know, and then have you guys seen the eulogy that Bob Costas did for Stan Museum? Yes. Yeah, I have. He talks about going back to Mantle at Mantle's funeral, how he was pretty composed, Costas, and looked over and there was the area that was roped off, you know, all the Yankee greats and the commissioner were all sitting there. And he said, I caught out of the corner of my eye standing in the back of the church, Stan Musial, mm -hmm. who was just getting over cancer. And he got on a plane and flew by himself. Not that that's a big deal, but didn't tell anyone and didn't go in the spotlight, just stood in the back and paid his respects to Mickey and left. And that just shows how he was even though mickey had his faults stan still loved him and appreciated him you know yeah um and uh another kind of thought with all that with him being a regular guy was you know he wanted to stay connected to fans and i, I remember reading this forever ago so one of the things that he would do um he taught himself how to do this and i thought this was really cool was he he would take a dollar bill and he would fold it have you ever heard this story before wow. He would fold it into origami and it would create a ring like that a kid could put on their finger, a little ring. And he knew if he folded it correctly, what part would be exposed as the front of the ring. So what he would do is he would take a dollar bill and he would autograph that little spot on the dollar. And then he would fold it up and he would carry these little dollar bill signed rings as like giveaways for kids. And uh, and after he had passed away, you know, he had Stan the Man Inc., which is where, you know, he had an office and people would send stuff for autographs and right. you know, where his, his business was. And uh, and they found in the bottom desk drawer uh, hundreds of these autographed origami rings that that he never gave away or that he had practiced on maybe. And, and I, the reason I heard about this was because there was an auction house that was selling off Stan Mutual's office things after he passed away so it wasn't from his playing days and this was a lot of these of these rings and i just thought that was neat in fact in that auction i thought well, i want something i want it bad um just be, to be connected and I, I started to put a bid on an item and then i was like you know what this is stupid why am i bidding on this it's just and i actually pulled my bid and it sold for 25 dollars. remember this and it was his stapler it was just it was just a stapler that you would put on your desk but it was right. from him. it was all that and now it's one of those things that, man, for 25 bucks, how cool would it have been if I could have pulled it out and this was his stapler, but I didn't buy it. And uh, and it's silly and dumb and, and a little probably over the top with fandom, but but how neat is that just to have that kind of connections with it? Hey, John but, Wade Boggs fan has Wade's jock strap, so. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, and I don't want to 
comment on that one too much. What do you guys think about this musical car? Oh, okay. Well, this like, from Sam's I'm, collection. So I, I'm I, like, I'm missing I, something here. I know you guys are. I had to get this. It. It's my other favorite player, but it was in Stan's collection. No, see, that's super cool. Oh, I was like, the, yeah, the the connection between him and and people is just, I don't know, I just love that kind of stuff. So the thing is, I cannot find a Clemente musical photo. I, I've looked everywhere. You know, Rick vintage all ball cards knows this guy that sells all kind of vintage photos. Didn't have anything, so I had to have my boy Scott make me this. There you go. I love this piece. Oh, that's great. I love that. That's so clever. This is from the 1960 World Series. That's the exact time that Maz hit that home run. Yeah. You know, just subtle things like that that he threw in there. But um, I'm just amazed that I can't find a photo of those two together. Yeah, it's really surprising. I had never thought of that. <clears throat> no. Um it's kind of a oddball piece. It's not from his playing days. Now, what is that from? It's a 1971 Allstate Insurance. And I oh, think okay. Someone told me, I think uh, Scott Stukes knows about these. I think there were four cards. Might have been Williams and Ruth, and I'm not 100% sure who the other players were, but just another, you know, not a playing days card, but something unique. Yeah, I, I was actually going to bring up the story about the the dollar rings you were talking about. So I don't know. Have you guys read this book at all? Yeah. The Baseball One Hundred by Joe Pesnansky. Yes. So um, uh, well, I don't want to give spoilers away where he's ranked in here, but um, anyway, so he had a pretty close relationship with him. I think he. <clears throat> so this speaks to him, the just the qualities of Stan himself again. Um. I guess I think he first did an article. He he was had to write a story and interviewed him and stuff about him never being thrown out of a baseball game. And a, I'm pretty sure it was a pretty popular article and that kind of started their relationship. And then a, I know he did a really nice obituary for him, too. But so he got to know Stan a little bit. So some of the stories that he got um, and that was one of them that like you were saying um, about DiMaggio and Williams. And I mean, that that was a great point, like just a year or two earlier he would have debuted i think he would always be i mean i think of him with those three because they played within two started within two years of each other but they just most people just think of dimaggio and williams because of the connection with 41 and everything else from there but um i mean dimaggio had to be he demanded that he was announced as the greatest living hitter of all time when he walked in a room and uh it's it's said in here about him doing the paper rings and he, he just not even the act of doing that, but the process of learning how to do that just so he had that in to do something. And he said about how he used to do walk up to, and I don't even think it was at his restaurant. I think it was just, if he was out eating dinner somewhere and most athletes would, you know, don't approach me or anything, he would approach tables of people if they were like celebrating a birthday or something and be like, Hey, look at this and fold up a dollar bill and give it to him. It was just, just that type of just, character his qualities is just what is so amazing about him and um i just wanted to say too he speaks in here about um never getting thrown out of a game so there was uh a, a game i think it was in 54 against the cubs they were losing by a run and wally moon was on first and stan came up and hit a double and drove him in and uh but they called it a foul ball and i think it was solly hemis i think was playing shortstop at the time and I forget who the other one was. Both got thrown out immediately, arguing it. Um, and Peanuts Lowry was about to get thrown out until Stan was just standing. At, he was, I think, standing at second base and just, well, what's going on? And they said, oh, they called it foul. He's like, there's nothing you could do about that. Came uh, back up to the plate, hit a double, like <laughs> almost the same spot, a foot to the left, and drove in the run just the same. It's just, it's just stuff like that is just so cool and so – like great name peanuts lowry yeah they actually he there's a little uh asterisk and it says at the bottom there's two there's two stories it says and he says there's a third story that might be even more interesting about one uh when he was younger they said he just uh was the size of a peanut and then i think they said that when he was a kid there was somebody that, just to get him to shut up they always used to give him peanuts and then he said, there's a third story, but this isn't a book about Peanuts Lowry. So. <laughs> so I'd like to know what that third story is. But, yeah, that's a great name. <laughs> great. 
Well, and it just shows the respect that the other players and teams had for Musial. Um, one thing, and I'm, I'm doing this from a distant memory, so if I'm in, inaccurate, I apologize, but I believe that the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, actually have Musial in the Dodgers Hall of Fame as the most feared opponent or the most respected opponent they ever had. And the fact that another team, a competitor, remember there's only eight teams in the National League right. back, actually put them in, put him in their Hall of Fame because he had that much connection to their team is just, that blows me away um, to think that. Uh, something, uh, again, referring back to the whole 1941 thing, I just researched a video that I released on, on Johnny Mize, and Johnny Mize was the first baseman for the Cardinals back in the mid to late 30s. And uh, Mize was, um, I think he had an injury or something, and, and, and he wasn't doing very well. And Musial came up, and uh, I think, you know, he, he, he played in the last, I don't know, month or so of the season. He hit like 400 or something ridiculous. And, uh, and, but the Cardinals ended up missing out of going to the postseason, to the World Series, to the Dodgers that year. And, um, and the manager said, you know, if we had Musial instead of Mize, we would have, um, you know, maybe we could have made the World Series and won the pennant. And uh, Mize ended up getting traded uh, to the Giants and then – or sold to the Giants. And then, uh, and of course, Musial's history started right there. So, uh, still, you know, you've got a guy who in, – in Johnny Mize who was a – you know, he was hitting 340 and, or 330 and all those other things, and he was a great hitter. And uh, but still, they're going to go ahead and get rid of him because there's this young kid named Stan coming up. And I don't know. I just think that's that's pretty interesting as well. Didn't the Dodgers give him the nickname, the man? Yeah, yeah. I, think it, I think it was in 46. Uh, like that man, the man. That yeah, because they weren't sure what they said at first. And they every time he came up, they'd, they'd start cheering. Here comes that man. And then afterwards, well, they thought that's what they said. And then afterwards. They said, is that, are they saying that man? They said, no, they're saying the man. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah. that kind of like that tie with the Dodgers is. Yeah, it goes back. A, a opposing team gives you your nickname. It's one of the greatest nicknames yeah. out there, in my opinion. Yeah. And a nickname is repeatable as opposed to other nicknames that we won't say here. So, um, from other <laughs> players. So, um, like Joe's email. In yeah. Facebook. We'll get into that afterwards. <laughs> so, I don't love these floating heads. But it's cool that you got three Hall of Famers on there with Rob yeah. Robinson, Aaron, and and Musial, and Bill White, who was was it president of the National League? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a neat card. Yep. And then uh, I'm running out of pieces here, but I'll show you a few more. And then we were talking about Mantle and Musial. Oh, that's a good one. I haven't seen that photo. Yeah, uh, Rick Oddball Card sent me that. So that's cool. And he's got these stamps. That was after his playing days too. I've got this, and I I think you have one, um, Don. I don't know the actual origin. I think I do, but it's a basically it's like a postcard. Do you have one of those? I do. I don't I know anything about that either. That's signed, and and you know it says compliments of Stan the Man Inc., St. Louis, Missouri, on the back, whatever. Um. And it actually has a website, standtheman.com, which means this was obviously right. in the early 2000s just because of that. Um, so I don't know why. The, I see these a lot. I see these at shows. I yeah. see these in collectors. They're not expensive. You know, this was, I don't know, it was probably less than $20. Um, I think really I've expensive. Of those by YouTubers. I think that's yeah. how I'm fine. Um, have you tried going on that website? Is it still? No, I haven't. In fact, I, it's in a case. and. And just now, as I'm showing the camera, I saw on the back that there's a website. That's why I mentioned it. So, What's it called? Stan the Man? It's StanTheMan.com, but they're hyphenated. Stan hyphen the hyphen man. I'm not, later. I'm not so, looking it up. That's too much work for me. Um, yeah. But uh, another piece that I have, and this is one of the displays I made a long time ago, is it's a, uh, a the Cardinals yearbook from 1959. And it, and uh, someone gifted me a cut autograph on an on a, uh, index card. So I put it in this this frame in this case, and um, that's it's just a that's great my picture. favorite magazine or yearbook of his. I love. I really want to get one of those. Yeah, so you can see uh, a great signature, and uh, you know, in I don't, I don't know, I like this piece. The, the red. Um, it looks like red art. Really, yeah, it's just really good. From Wheaties. Yeah. I love how you incorporate these things into your displays, through like that, and and the. 
the 54 um, Red Heart ad that you made in that. that oh, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, it's really cool how you're creative with that stuff. Well, I appreciate that. that it's just, to me, that's such a part of, uh, of collecting is display. And I think all three of us have our own take on it and how we do it. I mean, you, you helped me with these back here. Yeah, and they turned out great, you know, and you're one of my guys. Is, I'm sorry, we're getting off the topic, but, All right. you know, when I'm making something, I'll, I'll send you pictures, and what do you think of this and that, and and uh, not not to brag, but just to get a little comment sometime, and, because you're brutally honest sometimes. I'm just kidding. So. <laughs> How about your work? Your work's you're 10 times the woodworker I am, so. Oh, well. But I'm just 10 times better looking, so you got that. True. Mm -hmm. That is true. Except <laughs> on black and yellow you're wearing, but anyway. Um, Somebody's got to root for this team. <laughs> well, that makes two of you. So, right. um, <laughs> anyway, no, um, yeah, me, it's funny because I'm not, I always say this, I'm not an autograph collector. And when I say that, my wife rolls her eyes because I have a fair amount of autographs from different reasons. Uh, and of course, my, my main player, um, well, we already mentioned him, is Ken Griffey Jr. I have more Griffey autographs than anybody else. But second is probably Stan Usual. I really don't know. I've got, let me count real quick. One, I don't know. I probably have about six or seven different ones. I think I've shown most of them. I've got this. I don't even know where I got this. It's just, it's all his statistics and it's just a picture. It's kind of, I don't know. It doesn't really fit in with anything else. But again, uh, you can find his autograph super yeah. easy and, and not too expensive. And, um, and I have a ball. What I was saying about him going to tables, I think he carried photos in his suit pocket, autographed, and would just hand them out to people. Yeah, I think so. I'm trying to think of the story. I think there was a story where he was out to, uh, he was out in California and he was uh, eating at a cafe, like a sidewalk cafe with John Wayne. And, uh, and John Wayne was, you know, the big, you know, film star at the time. And of course they're constantly getting interrupted for, by fans to get pictures or autographs. And this is a personal time where he's having a, a meal or lunch and Wayne, John Wayne reaches in a suit pocket and he had pre-signed, little photos and he would hand them to people and Musial thought what a great idea you know like he doesn't he still wanted to to acknowledge the fan but it was a lot less time if they were pre-done and and i think he started doing that where he had photos pre-signed and so he would be happy to talk to you if he was out at the ballpark or that but if he's out with his family or out at his restaurant he was just at a point where he was just doing his own personal life you know he had something still but again the point of that is not that he was prepared he didn't blow people off. He wasn't like, get out of here, kid, you know, not right now or ignore, ignore people. He was still willing to interact because that was the one time that he could interact with that person. Um, but I just thought that was kind of a neat story. too. I didn't know he picked it up from John Wayne. That's I think that's where I heard it. I think that's what that was. Um, but again, I'm I getting into the Hall of Fame too. It always come out like this. Yep. Yeah. You know, he would come out on stage and do his little swing. And so, well, guys, man, we've been on here almost an hour. I think mm -hmm. we probably said enough about Musial to anyone that's still watching. <laughs> but um, you know, I learned I learned some new things today about Musial, and, and uh, that's kind of what I wanted to get you guys together on here because I, I I had a good time talking about my favorite player. And, yeah, uh, definitely. We'd be entertaining. So, any last comments you got, or anything else to show? Uh, pretty much, we've either seen it from somebody else or myself. But, right. Uh, but um, I'll end yeah. with a quote from the book here. Um, oh, there you go. There's yeah. a couple different ones, but there's always a, everybody loves a good Yogi Bear quote. So, like I was just speaking about what contemporaries think. So, this was, a, I think it was during the All-Star game. They were talking before the game how to get different people out. And they were talking the pitchers were talking with yogi about how to get stan musual out he said you guys are trying to stop musual in 15 minutes when the national league ain't stopped them in 15 years <laughs> <laughs> that's great great one to end on guys thank you so much i appreciate you coming on this fun topic and uh thoroughly enjoyed it i appreciate it don as well yep, thanks for having us on take care guys thank you